thank you very much first. So I will say that a field of Alzheimer's disease research is in a big trouble. After 20 years of research, thousands of people working on this disease, thousands of papers published, we have no idea what Alzheimer's disease is. We could cure our mice models, and that's really the number, 300 times in our labs successfully. None of these approaches translate into clinics. We cannot even slow down the disease, not even to talk about curing the same. So I see that as a problem. Many Alzheimer's disease scientists say, no, no, that's not a problem. Maybe we are just too late with intervention. Maybe we need to move with younger people to start treatments. Maybe instead of using inhibitors of specific uh, proteins or pathways, we should use modulators and stuff like that. And I think that's all valid. But I will today argue that actually Alzheimer's field is being misled by its own data obtained on transgenic animals that we call models of Alzheimer's disease. So this is a very strong statement, and many people will not like it. But we are not here to like each other or dislike each other, but we are here all on the same path to find a cure for this disease, or at least therapeutics that can maybe even slow it down. Okay, so let me explain you what I mean with being misled. I will give you a hypothetical example that we call here the airbag problem. And I can explain you in a very simple example how this may actually happen. So for that, you need to forget about biology, about anything you learn about Alzheimer's disease. Just think about cars. So think about car accidents. I can give you thousands of pictures of car accidents after they had happened. So pictures after the car accident. Give you these pictures and tell you, please look at these pictures and tell me what caused the car accident. Now, you don't know how the car works. That is, that's the, the, the basic. So, so you know, car is there to bring you from place A to place B, but you, have not, you don't know much more. So you look at these pictures. So what would you see is actually, uh, you know, you can sort, start sorting them. This is what we do. You can sort them by the type of the car that was in the accident, by the color of the car. Was the accident in the city? in the highway, small street, whatever, you can store that to find out. And these all things are different for each car accident. Sometimes the driver is alive, sometimes was dead after the car accident, all these things differ. But you will notice actually one thing, and that is that there is one thing always observed in a car crashes, and that's airbag. So whenever you see a car crash, you'll see the airbag there. In the normal cars, which were not involved in a car accident, there is no airbag. So as a scientist or a scientific mind, you will think, okay, airbag has something to do with the car accident. And of course you're right. You still don't know how the car works and what airbags mean and stuff like that. But you conclude this and that's, I think, correct. But then, you know, since you're serious, you go deep in research. So you, you, know, you dig in and what you will find is, actually that there is a series of pickup trunks that actually had a mechanical defect in the airbag deploy mechanism. And actually that would produce spontaneous explosion of airbag. And this of course happened in less than 1% of all cars, but during a drive this explosion will actually cause a car accident. And you find this. So you have two correlations. You have airbag always there, and you now found a car with a mechanical defect that will cause the car accident by exploding the airbag. So you make a hypothesis. We call that airbag hypothesis. The airbag is the cause of the car accident. And at this moment, that's fine. That's correct. This is what we scientists do. We make hypotheses. The next step is crucial to test the hypothesis. So how you do it? So what do you do is you make a, a lab, small lab car. You, you make a small airbag that you can actually deploy by pressing a button from your lab. You put these two together. You put a driver in and say drive. And the driver drives. You press the button. The airbag explodes and you get the crash. Now, you can repeat this many times 
it will always be the same. You can have different type of cars, different car type of airbags, maybe also from a side, from a bottom, or a whatever above. It will always be the same. Statistically significant increase in car accidents. So you have it. You have your model. You proved, under quotes, your hypothesis. So from then on, everybody will jump on it. Because the car industry wants to reduce the number of car accidents. And everybody will start working on it. So you will employ thousands of PhDs and postdocs. And you know, clinics will be interesting in that. And they will all work on the airbag mechanism. And after 20 years of work, thousands of papers published, a lot of knowledge accumulate, one group somewhere will come with the idea or a finding that there is this part called inflator, which is important to inflate the airbag during this airbag explosion. So if we can just remove that, we can prevent the airbag from deploying. And you can do that in your, in your small car, in your, in your lab car, and you in kind of have some plug-in that is called anti-inflator. You put that in your airbag, you press the button, the airbag doesn't explode, and there is no car accident. Hey, you cured it. And you can do that now 300 times with different mechanisms. Okay, so that would be a very interesting for you in the lab. Maybe you get a great position somewhere in Harvard or whatever, but you need a proof, and that's clinical trials. And that's why this talk is held now in a clinical trial center. Because this, you guys know what I'm talking about. Professors, group leaders, whatever, coming to and say, oh, look, I have this drug, it will work on patients. And you know better than I do that most of these trials fail. So you need three clinical tri phases to go through. And in our hypothetical model, it's easy to go to the phase one. Because if you remove an airbag from any car, it will not uh, the, uh, the struck the, the, the function of the car. So that's, that's passed. Now, if you're a bit more clever, you will say, OK, now let's try that in these cars with the mechanical defect. Let's go there. So we know that this is that in this car that this explosion, spontaneous explosion, is a cause. So we have this plug-in now in, and let's see. And if you're lucky, you will actually probably see that there is a decreased or abolished number of car accident that is induced by this airbag explosion. And you know that's awesome. That's clinical phase two. So you go now in the real world in a clinical phase three. And the question would be, if you start now removing airbags from all cars or producing new cars without airbags, would you reduce the amount of or the percentage of car accidents? So since we know how the car works and we know the purpose of the airbag, we know the answer is not. Okay. It's scary, huh? It's scary because it shows few things. It shows that Correlation-based hypotheses are very dangerous, specifically when we are working on a human diseases. We don't know how the brain works. We don't know why, is it something good or bad in a brain that we observe. But we make correlation and we make hypotheses. So that's already one step that we need to think about. We have to be very, very tough to our results. The second thing that you see also here is that you have a hypothesis and you can produce a lot of data. And all this data can fit, can support each other. Because they're based on your model, on your lab car. And all these data fit, but in a real world make, are completely irrelevant. Because you were wrong on the beginning with your hypothesis. So instead of testing, or sorry, instead of proving, which we try to do, we should test. We should be very tough on our, on our uh, experimental uh, and, and uh, approaches. Okay, but you know, this is a hypothetical example. So what is with Alzheimer's disease? I don't want to go into details of Alzheimer's disease because most of you know already that, but I just want to show you or remind you that we went through all these steps in Alzheimer's disease research. We have observation that in Alzheimer's brains there are this bad stuff called senile plaques and tau tangles. They are not present in the normal brains. So the normal, when I mean normal, meaning healthy, cognitively healthy controls. We know that in less than 1% of families, there is a mutation in genes that will affect production of A-beta, which, which is one of the major components of this 
uh, what we call uh, senile plaques. So these two fits. So we, found, we made the uh, amyloid cascade hypothesis based on this correlation. We have our small cars, we call them transgenic animals, because we can induce expression of either A beta or expression of these proteins which are found in, in families. We indeed have thousands of people, postdocs and students working on these models and similar. And we indeed have pathways that we identified and targets that we want to, to, to suppress, to modulate or whatever. And we indeed can cure the animals. I told you 300 times till now, even more probably. But none of this works in humans. This is just a small list. And this is list selected for the A beta immunization or the agent at lower A beta levels or gamma secretase inhibitors or modulators. And these are all clinical trials failed in the last two years. So as I said in the beginning, one may argue, and people do argue, that maybe we were late. Maybe we just need to go earlier in the disease. And that's okay. That's a good argument. But maybe before we wait that this fails as well, maybe we should start rethinking Alzheimer's disease or the mechanism behind the Alzheimer's disease. And this model just shows you that maybe we should do that. This airbag problem, because as I said, I argued that we suffer, the Alzheimer's field suffer on the airbag, on, under airbag problem. 